Good, good morning. Uh, welcome to the last, last day of Democracy Days. Uh, we have a, uh, let me grab my sheet here, we have another full day of events. Um, so first I'll introduce John Weeman in a minute, uh, but at 11.30 we're having a, a um, discussion on uh, DEI and healthcare at 11.30 with, with uh, of the occupational therapy people here. And then we're gonna wrap up at one o'clock today with a uh, discussion uh, by Jamie Navarro and Rachel McWhorter Rush, uh, English professors, about uh, protest music as democracy in action. So, um, so I'm grateful uh, for all the, it's been a great week. We've had lots of fantastic presentations and panels this week, so I, I'm, I'm excited. So again, you could catch any of these if you missed one, you wanted to see um, you, the school to prison pipeline, for example, or the, or the union thing yesterday, you want to go see that, it's on the Democracy Days website, so you can always go back and, and look at that any time. So uh, I think it was up there since last year, if I recall. So I think basically you have a, you have a year to watch it before they erase it and re replace it with this year's next year. So, so please go ahead and do that. Um, so today, uh, I'm going to welcome uh, John Weeman. Uh, John Weeman is the uh, Vice President of Workforce and strategic initiatives for SEC. Um, he's a degree in business management um, and uh, along with a master's in health administration from um, Missouri for MU, from MU. Um, he's worked in the healthcare field and he's also been, kind of exciting, uh, the president, I'm sorry, the speaker pro tem of the Missouri House of Representatives just a few years ago. Um, he, champ he championed several pieces of import several important pieces of legislation, if I can speak properly, um, including the Convention of States legislation, which is what he's going to be talking about today. So um, I'm not going to I'm not going to spend too much time because I, I I was just uh, just harassing uh, John about how much we want to make sure we have time for questions because it should be a really interesting conversation. So I'm going to turn it over right now to uh, John Weeman. Thank, Thank you, Paul. Appreciate it. Can, can you guys hear me? It sounds like you can hear me. Good. Uh, good morning. I know it's always exciting at 10 o'clock in the morning to come and listen to about constitutional uh, law, but uh, today I'm going to try to make it somewhat uh, exciting for you to, to learn a little bit more about it. I'm sure most of you know everything there is to know about uh, the Constitution and, and specifically Article 5. But, uh, for those who don't, we're going we're gonna to dig into it pretty deep here because it's something that is a movement that's occurring across the country, and uh, I think you, you would be very interested in learning more about it. So I, I will spare you of listening to me drone on for, for 45 minutes to 50 minutes just speaking to you. I, I do have some videos, so we'll be able to watch some videos today uh, to kind of explain Article 5. So first off, I think it's important that we know what is in the text of the Article 5. Um, and I'm going to read it to you because I think it's important to read it. Um, the Congress, whenever two-thirds of both houses, that's both houses of Congress, United States Senate and, and United States House of Representatives, shall deem it necessary, shall propose amendments to the Constitution or on the application of the legislatures of two-thirds of the several states. In other words, the states can also petition to have uh, amendments put onto the, onto the Constitution. Um, shall, shall call a convention proposing amendments, which in either case shall be valid to all intents and purposes as part of this Constitution when ratified by the legislatures of three-fourths of the several states or by uh, conventions in three-fourths thereof, as one of the other mode of ratification may be proposed by Congress. And I'm sure that just like, you're like, oh my gosh, just, you know, my eyes are, my eyes are glazing over now already. But it's important, those words are very important, we're going to dig into a little, a little bit deeper. Um, so the question we, we beg to ask is, why did the states need to call for a convention? What's the, what's the motiva motivating factor for Missouri and other states to say, hey, Time out, Congress. Time out, United States federal government. We think we may need to have a little bit of a reset. Well, let's talk about that. Um, the reasons, and these are just three. There's a lot of other reasons that are out there, but these are the three main ones that keep popping up 
um, across the country. First one is our debt and spending. I don't know if you've noticed this or not, but we do have a little bit of a, of a problem with our federal deficit. Um, and it's really unfortunately because for you as very young adults, there's a few, few seasoned adults in here, but that debt is being passed on to, to the future generations. And so that's a very big concern. Uh, federal overreach. Uh, as we all know, the federal government has just, they seem like they're getting in more and more into our, into our personal lives and just every aspect of our lives. And, and of course, the states um, are really concerned about state sovereignty, making sure that we can control somewhat of our own destiny versus having the big brother tell us what to do. And then, of course, uh, the other one is career politicians. You know, we always want to beat up on the, the evil politicians. I'm a recovering politician. Um, I used to say I didn't like being called a politician. I like being called a statesman. Um, politicians, we're all politicians. I always tell people all the time, we're all politicians. Um, you just don't know it. But anyway, those are the three main reasons why most of the legislatures so far that have, have called for a convention that's the reason why they're, they're proposing or requesting um, a convention. So the other one, let's just dig in a little bit deeper into the national debt uh, and the spending crisis. Um, here's the sad thing about it is, regardless of who's in office, whether Republican or Democrat, um, and for full disclosure, I am a Republican. I'm going to try to today give you both versions of, of this discussion. But, you know, the spending keeps going up. Uh, it's not going down, it's going up, and it's, it's going up at a, at, a, at a very scary rate. Um, Medicare, and I've heard this before many, many years, uh, where Social Security is going to go bankrupt, Medicare is going to go bankrupt. It, at this point, yeah, eventually those, those trust funds are going are to become insolvent, but right now there seems to be enough money in there to keep pushing it down a little bit farther. But they're projecting in 2024, Medicare is going to be insolvent, and then, of course, uh, Social Security will be pushed off to 2033, about the time when I get ready to retire. Uh, so let's talk about the national debt. As you can see, our debt was pretty low in the early 70s, and then really kind of around the Reagan and the Bush years, it started to really accelerate for whatever reason. And, of course, Clinton kept up the pace. Bush, uh, number two, he kept up the pace. We had a war going on there, too, by the way. And then Obama really took it to another level. And, of course, Trump, you know, he didn't slow down the process or the, the progress. And then, of course, Biden's keeping up with the trend. So it's, it's, both, it's bipartisan. The spending is out of control, and Congress cannot seem to stop it. How many of you do know, do, do we have a balanced budget right now with, with the federal government? Does anybody raise your hand if you think we have a balanced budget? We don't. We haven't had one for a long time. We keep passing these CRs, continuing resolutions, to keep pushing it off another six months, another 12 months, but we don't have a balanced budget for the federal government. Uh, government spending right now, now this, these numbers are outdated already, um, but if you, as you can see, it says mandatory spending. That's basically entitlement spending. That's Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid. Uh, those, are, those, are, those are funds that are social welfare programs for the most part, takes up six trillion, trillion with a T, trillion dollars. Our discretionary spending, that's pretty much everything else that involves the military, uh, running the government, you know, all the other things that, that involve with, with running our government, makes up 28% or what was the number? 1.6 trillion, almost 1.7 trillion dollars. And then, of course, we're paying $305 billion on interest alone on that, on that debt. That's not sustainable. It will eventually come, to, I mean, eventually we will not be able to, to pass on this. Um, the rest of the world's not going to continue to do this. So let's look at the preamble to the Constitution. And I'd like to read this too to you as well. Uh, we, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, and not misspelled, that's the way it was spelled in the Constitution originally, so don't, don't blame me for misspelling, um, promote the general welfare, and I put that in yellow to, to uh, emphasize that, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity 
do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of, of America. That's kind of like the mission statement for the United States of America. Now, I highlighted the promote the general welfare because that's a big argument about what government's supposed to be doing. Um, those who are more conservative think that the government shouldn't be providing everything to everybody, um, that, that you know, the government should do the basics, um, provide for defense, and, and just you know, make sure that, that there's tranquility, but don't go in, into a lot of social programs. And they're all, those are on the other spectrum, they're like, hey, Government should help, should help everybody, regardless of what their, uh, their needs are. So I like to, one of my favorite presidents, he said, I thought the function of government was to promote the general welfare, not provide it. So there's, that's kind of one perspective on that term, the general welfare. So let's talk about another problem that we have, and that is the federal government overreach. Um, so right now, and that number's outdated too, by the way. Uh, that's the, the, the best number I could find, was 180,000 pages of regulations um, is the average American, basically they say that on average you commit three felonies a day. So you're all felon, felons out here. Um, based on the number of regulations that you don't even know about, you are committing crimes, according to the federal government. Now, are you being prosecuted? No. but. Um, that's, that's a big concern. Uh, the federal uh, statutes and codes are just out of control. And Missouri's not much better. Can you give us some maybe common examples of this? Of common examples of? I, not off the top of my head, I couldn't. Um, it just, that, was, that was just a common, out of that many, that many uh, pages of regulations, there's somewhere in there, you're doing something that's going to be considered illegal. Um, so, and by the way, if you guys do have a question, feel free to jump in. I was going to say towards the end, um, you know, Q&A, but if you do have something that's on the top of your mind that you really want to get uh, me to, to address, feel free to, to uh, jump in. Um, anyway, one of the things that I, I find interesting is that the Constitution, um, at least the, the, the original part of it, was 3,000 words, and then the amendments added on another 4,000 words. And, uh, you know, so it's, it's about a 7,000, you know, 7,000 words. I think it says page, but it's a 7,000 word document. And if you look at what the, what the Supreme Court has done with all their uh, opinions, they've, they have a 3,000 page document of all the opinions of, of the interpretations of the Constitution. So it's, it's really gotten blown way out of proportion. People like us, people that are frustrated in Washington, D.C., often say, well, they don't follow the Constitution anyway. Not true. They follow the wrong one. They're following the Constitution as interpreted by the Supreme Court rather than the Constitution as written. This, taken out of my pocket, is a pocket Constitution. 4,000 words in the original document, 4,400 words, and if you count the Amendments, we're talking about 7,000 words, but here is the Constitution in force today. This is 3,000 pages of Supreme Court rulings showing what every ruling has done to the original words. This isn't going to get any smaller. In fact, every time they publish this document, they leave a bunch of blank pages at the back for additional rulings that they know are coming. Every page in this document means a grant of power to the federal government. Understand that this is the Constitution in operation today. And unless we change it, unless we make its wording crystal clear, we're going to continue to operate under this document forever and ever until the whole house of cards comes falling down. So, as you can see, we are just, we're just drowning in, in rules and regulations, uh, the federal bureaucracy, even the state bureaucracy, um, every time we pass legislation in Missouri, um, we as legislators, we make a mistake. We don't limit the, the bureaucracy and their abilities to, to write rules and regulations, which have the effect of law. We give them the authority. We say, hey, we want you to, you know, um, 
a recent thing is you can't text and drive. Well, we passed the law said you can't text and drive, but we told you know, a certain government agency, you're in charge of implementing that law, enforcing that law. Well, then they go and they create their rules and regulations, which become laws as well. And that's what's happening at the federal level. We're, we're, having, we're, we're giving the federal bureaucracy the authority to go ahead and write all these rules and regulations, of which many of us don't know what they are. We don't have the time to look them all up and constantly keep track of what we're supposed to do and not supposed to do. So the next issue that uh, we hear about a lot is, is uh, career politicians. Um, I have a different thought on this. I, I do think that you need to have people who have experience serving in government and certainly I have been in favor of term limits. In Missouri, we have term limits. Uh, it, it's an eight year term limit in the House, it's eight years in the Senate, and you can serve uh, eight years as governor. Um, we do have some term limits for some of the other uh, statewide office holders, a few that don't have term limits, but um, we have term limits in Missouri, and there are some advantages to that because that kind of kind of keeps a new flow of new people coming in with new ideas and people who can kind of um, not get, get, hate to say it, the longer you're there, you're there the, the, the greater the chance that you become corrupt. Um, and so term limits are good. The question is, is uh, the, the time frame. Uh, term limits has been very popular. It's passed in Missouri by, by wide margins. And we've tried to, on occasion, make them a little bit longer. So I'll give you an example. Um, do you think it's a good idea to have a new CEO of a company every two years? Probably not a good idea. Um, we, we're getting a new Speaker of the House every two years just because of term limits. So what's happening is, is, is that the, the bureaucrats, the, the staff that work in the Capitol, and the lobbyists who are there a long time, they're gaining more more power because they have the knowledge, institutional knowledge, and, 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 and understand how government works. So when a new elected person, whether they're Republican or Democrat, doesn't matter, when they come in, they are at an extreme disadvantage because they have no experience about what's going on in government. They, they don't have the, the knowledge about what happened, why this law was passed five years ago, 10 years ago. And so that's what's happened in Missouri. We've, we've really kind of, we've kind of hurt ourselves. We don't know it, but we have. Um, now, what that magic number is, is it 12 years? There's been talk about 12 years, maybe 16 years. Um, but just imagine in Congress, that's what's happening. Congress does not have term limits, um, except for the President of the United States. He can only serve a maximum of two terms, two four-year terms for eight years. So as you can see up here, you've had uh, former Speaker Pelosi. She's been in there 34 years. She's 83 years old. She's my father's age. And she's talking about running again. Uh, McConnell, we've all been watching him on TV. Um, he's 81, 82, he's in his 80s. He's been in 37 years. Schumer, 41 years. Um, and Grassley, he's a Republican. So two Republicans, two Democrats. It doesn't matter. They're all up there for a long time. The issue is, is I, and what I've argued is that instead of having term limits on every member, as I'll show you in the next slide, have term limits on leadership. So you can't have a person who's speaker for 30 years. Uh, over in Illinois, they had a speaker that was there for a long time, like 30 years, and he was very corrupt. And I think he's going to jail or has gone to jail. Um, anyway. The average tenure of Congress continues to rise. Now, it's still not that high compared to other things, but take a look at it. Um, as you can see, it's, it's, it's going up from, from the 1700s, when the average tenure was like two years. Now it's up to 11 years for senators, and it's almost nine years for congressmen, for, for representatives. And you know, in the realm of things, at, at about eight to 10 years, you're just starting to kind of figure things out as a legislator, to be honest with you. But you have leadership that's been up there, as you can see in those past slides. Those are all leadership. Pelosi was in leadership, Schumer's in leadership, McConnell's in leadership, Grassley's in leadership, all in the 30 years plus. So we have a problem with our federal government where we have leadership that's been in there way too long and we need to get, we need to clean it up.
And then another thing too I find interesting, because you always hear when people who are, who are um, against term limits, they'll say, well, you know, that's what we have elections for. You know, people can elect to get rid of that bad guy or bad person um, if they're not doing a good job. Well, I don't know, what do you think? 94.8% re-election rate. It doesn't matter if they're a really bad person or not. They're going to get re-elected almost 95% of the time. It's not working. So we're going to have to do something different, I think, to get things changed in, in Congress. So let's talk about the solution. What did the founders say? And of course, we're going to get into what the Missouri law uh, was about. I think I got a video here, so hold on a second. Let me click on it. The 15th of September, two days before they signed the document, the end of four long, hot months in Philadelphia, they were ready to go home. But George Mason noticed that Article 5 only had a single method for amending the Constitution. He said, wait a minute, what if Congress becomes an obstacle? given to us by George Mason, who said, look at guys, someday this government's going to abuse its power, and there won't be anything for you ever to ratify if it's counting on Congress to reduce the power of the federal government. So we need to give the states the ability to reduce the power of the federal government. What's just kind of scary is, is they're sitting there during the convention, and literally it was one of the last, almost the last topics that was that was brought up. Um, George Mason said, "Wait a minute here. Article five only allows Congress to do amendments to the U.S. Constitution." Um, and as you remember, if you had any of your history classes yet here at SEC, you know the whole issue. And, and I like to remind people all the time. Who's in charge? Is it, is it the federal government or are the states supposed to be in charge of America? You might want to answer that question or take a, take a stab at it. Who's who, let me ask you this question. Who created, who created the federal government? State governments. State governments did. Yep. The parents are being controlled by the child now. The federal government was created by the states, now controls the states. That's another reason why you're seeing us push. The states are saying, enough, federal government. You're using our own money against us but to tell us what to do. Um, and that's not what the original plan was from our founders, was that the states had state sovereignty, state rights. In most, in most parts of the world, the state of Missouri would be a country. We're bigger than a lot of countries. Population-wise, landmass-wise, GDP that we produce in Missouri, we're bigger than most countries in the, in the world. So we have 50 different countries that have come together, confederation of states, to form and allow to have a federal government on top of it to provide some uniformity and, and control, but not to, be, not to be dominating. So Missouri, when I first got elected in 2014, I took office in 2015, um, we started talking about Article 5. I didn't know anything about Article 5 and what, what, what the purpose of it was. And I learned very quickly that it, it's, it's a big deal. And, and I, knew that, I knew that Missouri was getting taken advantage of by the federal government. And I felt like, you know what, we need to find a way to, to push back. And this is the state's way to be able to push back against the federal government. Um, and so in 2016, no, 17, 2017, we passed our first SCR4. SCR4, um, and that was basically, um, it was passed, but we had a five-year sunset on it. So one of my friends, a state representative who was 
two, two chairs away from me, he, uh, he was a little concerned about letting it be, a, you know, no, no time limit on it, so he insisted on a five-year term limit, so we put five-year limit on it. So we passed it in 2017, and, um, and it was to propose amendments to limit the power of the federal government. And there's a picture of me. That's actually this year. Um, they had another convention, simulated convention, in Williamsburg uh, in, in August, and uh, Representative Travis Smith and I, I mean, Will, uh, Smith, we got to uh, go, go and represent uh, Missouri there. So let's talk about how it works. Um, first thing is, you have to have um, the people have to say, hey, we're not happy. We want something to change here. And so citizens will ask the legislators to sponsor legislation, put forth a resolution to apply to Congress saying we want to call a convention. So we did that in 2017. We did that again in 20, I'm trying to remember my dates here, 2018 and then in 2021, we passed our final uh, concurrent resolution, Senate concurrent resolution that basically said we want Missouri to be part of the Convention of States and we have three things that we want them to focus on. There's another picture of me, that's from 2016. Um, I was invited for the first, very first simulated convention that we had in Williamsburg as well. So here, are, yeah, I actually have it right here. So in 2017, we passed the, the first one, Five Year Sunset, then we passed one in 2018. Now, that, now if you noticed, in 2018, because our concern was that the five year time limit was gonna run out, so we thought we better pass another one. So another senator decided, well, we're gonna pass one that just deals with only term limits. So that, that actually just specifically said Missouri's gonna only look at term limits. Um, and then in 2021, uh, Senator Burleson, who's now a congressman, uh, he was able to get uh, Senate Concurrent Resolution 4 again passed, but that actually puts fiscal restraints on the federal government, limits the power uh, and jurisdiction of the federal government, and limits the terms of office for federal officials, federal officials and members of Congress. So then the next thing after, after, after two thirds, which is 34 out of 50 states, once they submit resolutions to, uh, to Congress and the clerk of the Congress receives 34 resolutions, at that point Congress has to, by law, by the Constitution, they have to call a convention. Uh, states can uh, send as many delegates as they want. They only get one vote. So we could send 100 delegates, but we only get one vote as a state. Um, the convention can also, the, the Congress can, can decide where and when and all that kind of stuff too. So they do have some control over that. So here's a, uh, once the convention occurs, this is what we do. We, we look at amendments that are proposed that have to be germane to the application. So in Missouri, the three things that we have to, um, that we're bound to only talk about. Anything else that's brought up in that convention that's not within the, within the, the, the realm of those, those uh, items that were approved in the applications, we can't discuss. So um, let's see, where does it say that in here? Yeah, proposed amendments outside of that agenda would be voted out of order. Any proposed amendments, any proposed amendments passed by a majority of the state delegates are sent to the states for ratification. So that's the next process. Right up here is an actual picture of 2016. That is the statement of convention right there. That's what we actually had as our, what our, our charge was when we were there at the convention, simulated convention in 2016. And it pretty much mirrors what, we, what we've been talking about, the three main things with the federal deficit and federal overreach and term limits. So the final step is amendments are ratified. So this is a quick test to see who knows their, their amendments. How many amendments do we have right now? He knows it, 27. How many, amendments, how many amendments have been passed by the states, not by Congress? One. One out of 27 have been passed by, and that was, does anybody know this? 
Now, any of you in here 21 years old? Old enough to drink? Prohibition. Congress, they were chicken, they didn't want to do it themselves, so they sent it to the states and had the states do repealing of the prohibition. It's what, the 16th Amendment, I think it is? Anyway, so as you can tell, there hasn't been too many conventions of states where we've, where we've added more amendments. It's not a, it's not a really you know, common thing. Uh, but anyway, 38 states have to vote and approve any amendments that the Convention of States were to propose. That's a really high bar. In Missouri, we can change our Constitution and we can do it with just a simple majority. We can also have initiative petitions put forth by citizens, supposedly by citizens, and those petitions can, be, can change our Missouri Constitution by a simple majority. But for us to change the Constitution of the United States to amend it, it takes 38 states, either by the legislature or by a convention of those states. It, individual states have their own conventions to do that. That's really a, a high bar. So Constitution is amended. So let's we'll talk about the current status of, of this movement for the Article 5 across the country. Um, this, this chart kind of gives you an idea of just from a, more of a support by party. Um, obviously the Republican Party in general is a little bit more supportive of this idea than the, than the Democrat Party, but the Democrats are still at 55% uh, and then others are at 62%. So f for, for the most part, it's, it's somewhat bipartisan uh, as you can see, a good, uh, good part of the country um, has uh, already you know, moved forward with the Article 5 uh, application, and there are several that are still, um, still debating it. Next slide shows you the actual, who, who, right now, who has passed a resolution for the Article 5. We have 19 states. Missouri was the 12th state to do it. And uh, we have, um, there's a few other ones. I don't have, the, I don't have the, the thing to be able to show you which ones are where they're at. But as you can see, uh, I think there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight states that have passed it in one chamber but haven't passed it in the other chamber. And then there's a few states that have not done anything, California being one of them, and Nevada, Oregon. Um, and there's others that are, that are actively pursuing it right now in legislation. And it takes sometimes years of education and understanding about what's happening at the state level before you can do it. And of course, there's always politics involved, so it just depends on who, who's in charge and whether they want to push it or not. But as you can see, it's a growing trend. And I think there's still that, the wishful thinking that that if we get close to 34 states that maybe Congress will finally realize, hey, you know what, this is, this is getting real. Uh, the states are serious about change and maybe Congress will reform themselves. I smile when I say that. Um, but I'm not too optimistic that Congress is gonna reform themselves. So we're probably gonna have to go all the way and get 34 states to, to call a convention before we might start to see some change. It's a long play, it's not a short term play by any means for, for the states, but that's where we're at. Okay, objections or arguments against a convention of states. I think it's important that you, that you look at both, both sides of the story. It's not, you know, just because I'm up here telling you it's a great thing doesn't mean it's, it, it is. I, I, I think you should, that's one thing I always told my sons and I'll tell you and that is God gave you a brain, use it. Look at all sides of the story, and especially when I was in, in, in office. Um, you know, the Republicans aren't always right. The Democrats aren't always right. A lot of times the truth is somewhere in the middle. And we have to be able to use critical thinking, dig in, do your own research. It's so easy to do research now with, with the internet. I didn't have the internet when I was a kid. I had the encyclopedia. You guys even know what an encyclopedia is? You guys are lucky. You have, the, you have wealth of knowledge. You have AI, for God's sakes. We didn't have that stuff when, we, when I was a kid. And I'm not that old. 
But I'm telling you, there's no excuse for you not to be able to go do your own research, use your own brain, and figure it out yourself. Don't let someone tell you what to believe. Use your brain, look at the facts, make sure there are the facts, because sometimes the facts can be manipulated, and look at both sides of the story. So let's look at both sides of the story. I'm going to use videos to do this, because these guys are, these are experts in this area. This, this gentleman coming up is definitely an expert in this area. So first one is, we only have had one constitutional convention, and it was a runaway. The Article 5 convention isn't a safe process. So that's one of the arguments. Um, and that is a valid concern. I mean, you don't, sometimes you don't want to mess, mess with something, because once you open up Pandora's box, it could be a bad thing. So I think that's a le legitimate concern that, hey, if we start messing with the Constitution, we might not be happy. It might have the unintended consequences. And so therefore, maybe we shouldn't mess with it. That's the argument. Um, and he's going to try to address that question. Hi, I'm Mike Ferris. I am the co-founder of the Convention of States and a longtime practicing constitutional lawyer. One of the most common objections we hear to the Convention of States goes something like this. We've only had a constitutional convention one time, and it was a runaway. So it's not a safe process. Let me tell you why this is incorrect as a matter of historical fact and from a clear reading of the text of our Constitution. First, Article 5 was given to us by the founders because they knew and said aloud at the Philadelphia Convention that Congress would never propose amendments curtailing federal power. Only the states could be trusted to do that. So the states were given exactly the same power Congress has to propose specific amendments to the Constitution. Second, we can now see that the difference between the Philadelphia Convention held in 1787 and an Article 5 convention that we'll hold uh, in, in the near future, hopefully, is that Philadelphia was called under the residual power of the states to propose a new adequate constitution. But any convention called under Article 5 can only propose amendments and only those amendments that are indicated by the call for the convention that has been passed by 34 states. You're limited to those specific amendments. Third, the Constitutional Convention in 1787 was not a runaway. It was not a runaway convention, and people who are doing that are undermining the credibility of the Constitution itself. And frankly, the misunderstanding arises from reading a resolution passed by Congress endorsing the Philadelphia Convention. And that endorsement resolution has no more authority then or now than an endorsement resolution now passed by Congress commending National Pickle Week or something. It's just Congress giving its opinion. We know under the Articles of Confederation, Congress had no implied powers, and they certainly had no power whatsoever to call a convention for this purpose or make the rules, and they didn't do so. They did not call the convention. Only the states could call the convention under their residual power from the Declaration of Independence, and that's what happened. The delegates followed explicitly the instructions that were given to them by each of their respective states, and the states gave their delegations full authority to propose our Constitution. And you can read all the details of this. This is a lengthy article, uh, over 80,000 words, in my article published by the Conservative Law Review at Harvard University. It's called the Harvard Journal of Law and Public Policy, available free on the internet. Fourth. Our founding fathers were not rogue delegates. They were honorable statesmen. They followed their state's instructions explicitly. They gave us our wonderful constitution that includes Article 5's convention process. In that article, they gave the states the authority to propose amendments to curtail federal abuses of power. State legislators, therefore, have the moral responsibility to use the power given to them by Article 5 to accomplish that purpose, to curtail federal abuses of power. Those abuses are paramount and obvious. It's time for the states carry out their moral and constitutional responsibilities. Thank you. So let's look at another question. Um, there's no way to control a modern day Article 5 <clears throat> convention. They might throw out parts of the Bill of Rights or draft a whole new constitution. <clears throat> so once again, their concern is that, that we will 
we will completely just eliminate the existing constitution. So here's um, Mr. Meckler explaining. Excuse me? Yeah. Sorry, can you tell me his name? Mark Meckler. He'll, he'll say his name here in a minute. Hi, I'm Mark Meckler. You know, some people worry that a modern-day Article 5 convention could go rogue and do something crazy, like maybe throw out parts of the Bill of Rights or the Second Amendment or even draft a whole new constitution. But that literally cannot happen. There are numerous redundant protections on the Article 5 convention process. The convention itself only has the authority to consider the amendment proposals which fall within the scope of the 34 state applications which trigger it. And anything beyond that's out of order. It's non-germane to the convention. It can't even be considered. The state delegations themselves, well, they're selected by the state legislatures. And those legislatures give them the authority through written instructions which are legally binding according to standard principles of agency law. It's not complicated. They can actually be recalled by any state legislature at any time. And any actions which might be taken outside the scope of the commissioner's authority, well, they're null and void by law. It's as if they never even voted. It's also absurd to think that 38 states would ratify an amendment proposal that expands federal power. After all, the 34 states that called the convention agreed to have a convention to do exactly the opposite. So it's important when you're considering convention of states, act on the facts and not the fear. Uh, another question is, a convention is a bad idea because Congress will just take over it. Congress will choose the delegates, set the agenda, and make the rules. Uh, this gentleman right here is not the best picture of him. He, sir, I, I actually have met him many times, uh, Rick Santorum. And maybe some of you guys might remember, Paul, you might remember, he actually came to this campus when he was running for President of the United States and um, he had a pretty good turnout. Uh, so anyway. So US, former U.S. Senator Rick Santorum, he's going to give his thoughts on, on that question. Hi, this is Rick Santorum, and I'm here to talk to you about the claim that uh, opponents of the Article 5 convention process make with respect to uh, Congress taking over the convention, uh, being able to appoint the delegates, write the rules, and then bas basically control everything that goes on. Uh, under Article 5, Congress has two specific powers. Number one is to call the convention, and number two is to determine how the amendments that might come out of that convention are ratified by either a state convention, uh, by 34, 38 states, excuse me, or uh, by the state legislature simply passing it through both houses of the legislature. That's it, that's their entire power. Everything else is a, uh, not based on any any sort of facts. And in reality, it, it's, it's virtually impossible for Congress to do this. Uh, number one, uh, Congress in the past has actually tried to assert itself into the Article V convention process. After Roe versus Wade was uh, passed by the Supreme Court, there was an effort by the states to, in fact, uh, overturn Roe uh, by going through a convention of the state's process. So there were bills introduced in Congress to, to head that off, to give Congress back control of any Article V convention. None of those bills even got out of committee. They weren't even voted on. Uh, there is no appetite that if 34 states goes comes forward and gets through the legislative process to pass a convention of states, that somehow Congress is going to come in and, ri and override what the state legislatures are doing. This, is, this means that there's a broad popular wave out there, and Congress is not a courageous body. They're not going to get in front of, of that train. Plus, they'd have to pass, a bill would have to pass the House, pass the Senate with 60 votes, and get signed by the President. Very, very, as you can see, Congress doesn't get anything done that they have to do, much less get things done that, that, that are even more difficult. It would be against broad public support within the United States, 34 states having passed something. So the, the idea that Congress is going to somehow come in and insert itself uh, into, this, into this picture is simply not, uh, not possible from the standpoint of politics and not, in, not legally allowed from the standpoint of what the Constitution says. Another question is, uh, the whole problem is that the federal government doesn't obey the Constitution, so why should we think that they're going to change, uh, change what, what we fix, or it will fix anything? Hi there. I'm Rita Peters, the Senior Vice President for Legislative Affairs with Convention of States. 
I know that some people say, well, the whole problem in our country today is that the federal government doesn't obey the Constitution. So why should we think that changing the Constitution will fix anything? But the problem isn't quite as simple as the federal government simply not obeying the Constitution. The problem is that they have found loopholes in the language and gotten court interpretations that stretch the Constitution to mean what they want it to mean. And the only way to fix that problem is through amendments in black and white that use modern language to reverse bad court interpretations and replace them with proper ones. For instance, imagine if we had an amendment making it clear that the General Welfare Clause doesn't give Congress authority to spend money on anything that falls outside its enumerated powers. Or imagine an amendment saying that the Commerce Clause doesn't give Congress power over anything that remotely or indirectly affects interstate commerce. Amendments do make a difference. Can you imagine America without the Bill of Rights or without the 13th or 14th Amendment? So don't listen to people who tell you amendments won't do anything. And then the last one is we have no idea how a convention would work because Article 5 doesn't tell us. <clears throat> I can tell you, I've been to two simulated versions of it, and we, we had pretty well laid out, you know, rules of how to conduct business, um, and it, it went, both times it went smoothly. The only, the only problem we had is we only had a, a day, literally, a day to, to debate and, and discuss proposed amendments, where in reality, if it was a real convention, it could be months, maybe even almost a whole year, of, of a convention meeting, debating, and, and, and working through amendments. So let's get one final word here. Hi, I'm Rick Green, America's Constitution Coach, with a few thoughts on how an Article V convention would work. You know, the Founding Fathers gave us this great gift in the Constitution, a way to save the Constitution from folks in Washington, D.C. when they get out of control. The only way, frankly, to put Washington, D.C. and the federal government back in its box is using Article 5, the Convention of States for Proposing Amendments. This was a tool that the founders gave us, and it was a tool they were familiar with. Some people today say, oh, I don't want to support a convention because we have no idea how it will work. Well, that's not actually true. This was a term of art for the Founding Fathers. They knew exactly what they were talking about. They didn't go into great detail because they had done this so often. We had dozens of interstate conventions, and many of these at the Constitutional Convention, some of the founders of the Constitutional Convention, had participated in these other interstate conventions. So they knew exactly what they were talking about. To not use an Article V Convention of States for proposing amendments because it doesn't lay out every little thing about how a convention would work, that makes about as much sense as saying we're never going to do a grand jury because the Fifth Amendment doesn't lay out exactly how a grand jury would work. Or we're never going to have a civil jury trial because the Seventh Amendment doesn't give any real details on how that jury trial would work. Or even habeas corpus will never protect habeas corpus because Article 1, Section 9 doesn't give us enough detail. Folks, the Founding Fathers knew what they were talking about. They gave us a lot of other information in the Federalist Papers and their other writings and all of the interstate conventions that they had participated in. Let's be sure that we learn from those other conventions, things like every state gets one vote when they get to a convention, that states can actually limit the call, that they can give instructions to their delegates, that the states get to decide who the delegates are going to be for their state and how many they want to send to the convention. All of these things are clearly laid out in the history of interstate conventions and we should follow that information, learn that information, and not be afraid to use this very important tool that can save our constitutional republic. You know, another thing I would like to point out is that um, there's, there's two differences between a constitutional convention and a convention of states to propose amendments. Constitutional Convention is literally, we're going to completely rewrite the Constitution or write a new Constitution. A Convention of States is simply a mechanism for a tool for, for the states to propose amendments, to amend the existing Constitution. Now certainly an amendment to the Constitution can have dramatic effect. Uh, amendment to the Constitution could remove something from the Constitution. 
um, in addition to adding something to the Constitution. But there are two differences between when you hear that Constitutional Convention and you hear Convention of States, there are really two different types of mechanisms of controlling the ruling document that we follow. Um, I do have one more. Uh, I know I want to leave some time for, for discussion. I got a, a, a U.S. Senator. Um, his name is uh, Michael Braun. He's from Indiana, and he gave a nine-minute speech. So it's, I know it's nine minutes, so if you can bear with me nine more minutes, then we'll go into Q&A, and I think we got enough time, uh, Paul, to, to do a little Q&A. But I thought he gave a great speech. It was a, a, a couple years ago, like two years ago, and um, on the Senate floor, this is a current U.S. Senator from Indiana, and I thought, it was, I thought it was pretty good, so I thought I might share it with you. Mr. President, Senator from Indiana. state of Indiana is America's heartland. I have traveled to every county, listened to businesses, schools, churches. I think that's where we need to get our cue in terms of what needs to be done. Farmers as well, they're in the middle of something that they've never faced before, probably the toughest job and business out there, never been tougher. The American people are strong and resilient, but they are represented by a government here that is not necessarily the same. Sometimes get scoffed at, but they live within their household budgets. State and local governments have guardrails, but naturally would do it anyway, because they know you can't borrow money from future generations and spend it today. Bad business plan. For this reason, I think the U.S. Congress is broken, because we have kept shoving this issue down the road. Having done a budget that we've adhered to in nearly 20 years, the last time we did it, we were most ingenious about how to unravel it roughly 10 years ago. When they look at our capital, they see a twisted knot of lobbyists, corporate interests, and a mountain of debt that just gets higher and higher. We now spend over a trillion dollars more each year than we take in. And recently, that's gone up to 1.5 trillion. To normalize that just does not make sense. We are here twiddling our thumbs while our kids' and grandkids' future go up in smoke. Every American family is paying for our failures here. Congress as a whole, and particularly this uh, body, seem to have no interest in turning this big ship away from the rocks. In the past year, I've brought to the floor four chances to do something. I offered a complete federal budget that would match our spending and our revenues that are historical in nature. Only 34 senators voted for it. It would have preserved Social Security, Medicare, defense, just bringing it in line with what's sustainable. I offered an amendment that if we fail to get our budget and appropriations bills done on time, by the deadline, which is like in a few days for this year, we don't get paid until we do so. 47 senators voted for it. Close, but still not there. I offered an amendment to cut pet projects through earmarks from our huge spending bills it only got 35 votes. And we were doing that for almost 10 years, and now we've actually backslid bad behavior. I've offered an amendment to require a balanced budget like so many states have. They live in fiscal sanity, 47 votes short again. The framers of our Constitution saw this coming. Uh, they had to raise revenue, especially back then, to do whatever they wanted to do. There are also checks and balances. Congress isn't just balanced by the Supreme Court and the President, but also by the states. Article 5 of our Constitution gives the states 
the power to pick up the slack when Congress refuses to act, where it doesn't exercise discipline, good behavior, what all of us expect. I believe the House and Senate desperately need two things. Term limits, the founders never imagined people would come here and like that better than what they did before. Washington, Jefferson, hurried back to their farms and their businesses. That's not the case anymore. If we keep doing it the way we are, we're going to get increasingly, increasingly deeper in the hole. With term limits, we would get a class of political entrepreneurs here that have actually done something in the real world before they think they can run the business, the biggest business in the world, and deliver such poor results. If two-thirds of the states petition to call a constitutional convention, we could take power away from the D.C. establishment and put it back in the hands of the American people. You're not going to believe how close that has come and how close it is currently. But the swamp, I think, knows that. That is why each time the right number of petitions have been filed, Congress refused to call the convention. The last time was as recently as last year. Today, 32 states have active applications for the convention. We need 34. It was actually at the level or above until a few states rescinded that. This plan is extremely popular because it makes sense. It puts political will and backbone into this place that we don't know. Sorry. I was trying to see how much longer we had. <laughs> All right. We'll end it there. Anyway, I, I hope that you were able to gather some valuable information out of this conversation today. Uh, certainly, a lot of you, this is the first time you've heard of it. You need to digest it. You need to do your own research and, and understand it. Uh, I'll be happy to take any questions, if anybody has any questions. I, I've got just a, a one. One of the things that struck me when I was watching, I teach poli-sci, so I'm interested. The um, one proposal was to eliminate the implied powers doctrine, so Congress can only do what is specifically spelled out in the Constitution. That would eliminate Social Security, Medicare, Obamacare, all those programs. Um, do you, are you aware of that? Do you, I mean, do, do you think that, I mean, that, is that kind of the goal or? No, I mean, like I said, it, this past August when I was at the simulated convention, um, you know, we had representatives and senators from all over the country and some of the most simple, easiest things you would have thought that we could have agreed on. We were sitting there arguing about for hours just trying to, to get through, you know, those topics because they're not as simple and easy as they appear to be. They're very complicated. And so, you know, to your point, Paul, there, there are certainly, when you make an amendment to the Constitution, you have to be aware of the, of the unintended consequences of, of that decision. And, and unfortunately, I've seen it firsthand as a legislator when we thought, hey, we're doing really good here, and we thought we thought of all the things that could possibly happen. I think I just lost it. There we go. We thought we, th we had figured everything out, and then we passed the law, and then we find out a year later, oops, we got a problem here. So hence, we do a lot of cleanup work in Jefferson City, and they do a lot of cleanup work in, in Washington, D.C. But yeah, that's certainly uh, a, a concern that we don't, that I don't think that's the intent, is to wipe out you know, Social Security and the rest of that, I think the, the question was more of just um, pushing back on the federal government's authority and what, they're, what, they, what they think they're supposed to be doing and what, what, they're, what we don't think they should be doing. Okay. I have a question. I think you have a question. No, thank you. Uh, I have a concern about the one state, one vote issue. The Democratic or the demographic in this country is changing. It's not going to be a white majority uh, for very much longer. And in states that do have a white majority, as opposed to states who have a broader demographic, that doesn't seem exactly fair in terms of how that would uh, affect representation. Well, I, I, you know, certainly, um, 
you can have that interpretation that there that you feel like there's maybe not going to be proper representation, but that that representation is 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 pushed down at the state level. So the states they will um, elect their own commissioners to represent the state, and based on the state's demographics and whatever, they're going to they're going to select the people who they believe are going to represent them best at that level at the state level to go represent them at the convention. So I, I think I, I think there is that 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 kind of addresses that issue with regards to. Um, I understand how that works. I understand what those states would be doing mm -hmm. in terms of choosing uh, representation, but it still doesn't address the fact that you've got a state like Wyoming having the same authority and same input as a state like California, which is dramatically different in terms of its demographics. My, but my follow-up is we've had two moments in history in this country, the, under the Articles of Confederation and then briefly under the misguided Confederacy, where the states had all the power, or a good, a significant share of the power, and that didn't work out very well. Well, the states created the federal government, so if you're, that's what you're proposing, that the, the, the states don't have control of the federal government, then we're just subservient to them, then that's kind of contrary to what our founding fathers believed um, when, they, when they formed the Constitution in the first place and had the confederation um, of states come together was to have a, an overall structure, but not have it be all domineering and controlling over all the states. Otherwise, we, why do we need to have state legislators? Why do we need to have a governor? Why do we need to have any local control? Let the federal government do it all. Um, but to your point about uh, like the equal representation, once again, those, those are just delegates that go to the convention of states to propose amendments. The final decision, Trust me, California, they're going to they're gonna debate, they're going to argue amongst themselves as to whether they agree to or not agree to a particular amendment. So they're going to have plenty of representation uh, on whether they want to approve it. It still takes 38 states, um, and there's plenty of states that are on one end or the other end to be able to block something that they may feel is not um, going to be their, to their liking. We have a student question over here. Yeah. Uh, I, just, uh, I noticed you uh, mentioned Ronald Reagan was one of your favorite presidents, and uh, you uh, quoted him here. I wanted to know what some of your reasons were for that, uh, especially given some of his administration's uh, major failings, like his inaction during the AIDS epidemic, uh, his funding of weapons to uh, American enemies, and uh, his participation in the overthrow of uh, foreign democratically elected governments. Well, obviously, this is a discussion about Article Five. It's not a discussion and a debate about you know particular presidents. I have a lot of a lot of favorite presidents. I mean, I actually um, have some Democrat presidents that I, I thought highly of. But um, you know, Ronald Reagan was. I was a kid. I was your age. I was in high school actually. I didn't get to vote for Ronald Reagan, and he was really the first president I really, as a young adult, kind of uh, really kind of paid attention to and, and watched. And I think. Um, for me, I was inspired by him, and I thought he had a lot of great ideas, and I, he did do a lot of good things. Just, you know, we're all, we're all human beings. We all make mistakes, and unfortunately, politicians are human beings. They make mistakes, and and you're going to find out in your in your life there are going to be some politicians that you really thought were wonderful, and later on they're going to they're going to let you down. That's life. No one's perfect. We all make mistakes. Um, and certainly Reagan was not, not perfect, and he made mistakes just like a lot of other presidents have made mistakes and continue to make mistakes. Um, so I, you know, I don't judge a person on a few mistakes that they make. I judge them on the totality of the person and what they've, what they've accomplished. So that's my, that's my spiel. Hello, everybody. <laughs> I could sit all day and talk to you guys about politics. But I'd say for students, this isn't about the speaker. It's more about students. We should be paying attention to what this is. Not the, not, okay, how this works. Why would they be holding this kind of um, convention? What is at risk? What is happening in our country? Whether you vote for whoever or whatever, you need to be knowledgeable on your own accord of the risks and the benefits. So this is a lot of information that a lot of people are not gonna understand because of all the talking and whatnot, but the general you know, constitution and the general um, amendments and laws, you need to be aware of that. Does that make sense? 
Okay. I appreciate your comments. And, and I told you earlier, I, made, I told you from the very beginning, I said, you guys, God gave you a brain, use it. Think critically for yourself. Don't let someone, just one person tell you, oh, this is, this is how you should believe something. That's fine. You can listen to, listen to lots of different opinions, but use your brain, think it through, look at all the facts, make sure you're looking at all the facts, because sometimes, you know, there are, there are, there are uh, what did, uh, I think it was Winston Churchill once said, there's statistics and then there's damn lies. And have you ever had, any of you had a statistics class? Well, when you take one, you can see how you can manipulate the numbers. Numbers can be manipulated, facts can be manipulated, they're done all the time. So just because what you read, I love that commercial, it's a State Farm commercial, you see that girl, she's walking down the street and she's on the internet, and she says, well the internet told me so I'm supposed to meet this sexy guy from Paris, and he shows up and he's some nerdy guy, he's like, oh I'm, you know, whatever, Pierre, he goes, and she goes, well it said it on the internet, and he was, just because it says it's on the internet doesn't mean it's right. So be, be aware of that too. Other questions? Yeah. Hi. Um, I had a question about federal overreach, and it's your, I want your opinion. Um, if we limit how many rules and regulations are proposed, would that help or hurt us? Because you mentioned that in 2022, um, that every two hours and 38 minutes at this pace, they were reaching new regulations. So do you think if we limited at that time, it would help us and get to more important issues or hurt us in the end? Yeah, you know, you, you just unfortunately have not experienced the, I mean, you see regulations, even at this institution, we have a lot of regulations and rules. Um, but in, in life, you're going to be exposed to a lot of rules. You, you go deal with the DMs, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the, the Department of Motor Vehicles, DMV. I mean, they got all kinds of regulations and rules. And you go, it just, it's, it's overwhelming. And business, in the business world, I mean, that's one of the number one things that they complain about. It's like, we're just overwhelmed with all these rules that we have to follow, and we, we, can't, we can't make any money. We can't, you know, we're spending all our time just doing, bill, uh, doing rules. So we have to find a way to put some restraint on that. Um, I actually tried to propose a, a legislation when I first got into the Missouri legislature to sunset all state regulations. And obviously, it didn't go anywhere because the you know the bureaucrats didn't want, want that to happen. But I wanted to be able to like hit hit the reset button. If it's a, that important of a rule or regulation, bring it back to, to the legislature. Let us let us uh, review it and debate it and determine whether that's a good rule or not to, to be put on as a rule or law onto the onto the people. So that's kind of what I think the the overall intent is to really try to restrain the federal government from all their rulemaking that's going on. It's just, it's, over, it's out of control. So, yeah. Oh, also if the federal government, originally America was essentially a confederation with the Articles of Confederation, but they found it wasn't very good and they replaced it with the modern constitution. Also some of the most popular presidents did basically nothing but increase the federal government, like FDR, only president to get more than two terms. He actually got four, then they said you can only have two terms because he could just keep winning. So I always found that interesting. Yeah. Th thank you for your comments. Anybody else? Any other questions? Oh, uh, not, my, not my, a tough one. <laughs> no, no, no. My, my question is, if, if 34 states say we want to do this, do all 34 states have to agree on the items that will be discussed in their conventions? So all, so I wasn't clear about that. Yeah, the that. application, that's why if the application, notice. I saw the application from Missouri, but all 34 states would have the same application. And so those are the only topics. See, that was my concern when I was against it before yeah. I told you I was against this. Mm -hmm. It, it's a control of it because as you know the Articles of Confederation when Madison met in Philadelphia He didn't have the authority to change the Articles of Confederation. They were supposed to amend the Articles of Confederation mm -hmm. They all agreed there. No, we're not going to do that. We can't amend it We got to start over and because they already had a, a drastic revolution from yeah. the Articles of Confederation to the Constitution No, it's I think very, that's my fear. Yeah, and if they're if they're and I think what I would focus on in the future for all young people, because it is a lot of information, is uh, specifying that part, what would be talked about, what would be discussed, and that's it, as you mm -hmm. said. 
I think that's the critical thing. Other items might try to be brought up, but no, that's not what we're here for. We're for these particular yeah. amendments. And I think if you do that, it's, with all this other stuff, all the, it's pretty confusing. You, you make a very good point, and that's where earlier when I told you about the Missouri law, um, as you'll see in here, um, see how we passed the first one? That, one? that one basically had all the language that was down here, the three, the three components um, with regards to the commissioners are authorized to propose amendments that impose fiscal restraint on the federal government, limit the power jurisdiction of the federal government, and limit the terms of office. That was the same thing we passed in SCR4 in 2017. Now 2018, look what, look what happened. All we did was we passed an SCR that said, all you're allowed to talk about is term limits. So it, it changed, but this, this last one we passed is consistent with all the other applications with the other states around the, around the country that are passing their, their resolutions. It, it's including those three provisions. And they, they, that was and exactly why they wanted to do it that way, it's to, to eliminate any, anybody coming in with another, because if I'm a, if I'm a Missouri commissioner, I show up and they're, and they're wanting to talk about something else, I'm not authorized to talk to, talk, talk to talk about anything else other than those three things that, are, that I'm authorized by the Missouri legislature to talk about. Okay, we got time for a couple more quick questions here and then. Yes, uh, so for clarification, for the really long regulations and amendments, um, is the goal there to reset and then build back up again? Or is it to reset and then keep the regulations and the amendments minimal? What's the end goal there? That uh, the end goal is to, is, to re is to reduce. It's not, you're not going to eliminate regulations, but it's certainly to reduce the quantity and, and the ability for them to be able to write a bunch of new regulations. That is the, the, the part of that over government overreach is to, because that's what, that's what the federal government does. They, they, they control us by, by regulation and they control us by money. So they'll, the federal government will say, hey, Missouri, you want this billion dollars for whatever it is, uh, you know, you can have it, but you gotta follow these rules. Well, we may not like all those rules, but in order for us to get the money, we have to, you know, that's, that's how it works. And it's, what's ironic is it's our money that we gave them in the first place, and they're telling us that we can't have it because if we don't follow their, their, their uh, edict. So that's what, we're, that's what we're referring to on the government overreach is really more, not just regulations, but also the, the, the money issue too. Uh, it looks like we're running out of time here. I'm a full-time student here. Uh, <laughs> thank you. When I f first voted, I voted like my father did. Later I found out that was a bad mistake. Haven't done it since. So don't vote like your father did, <laughs> think for yourself. Thank you so much. And also, if you haven't, if you're not registered to vote, please, there are the tables out there. It is two minutes registered to vote, super easy. You just scan a QR code. Thank you, John Wieman, for Thank your you. presentation.